There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. This sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past are broken at last I got saved, oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I've received nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved, I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord, I'm restored and made right, He got a hold of my life, I've got Jesus, how could I want more? The love of God gave me His pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. The love of God pulls me up higher. It's really stronger. That's why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've got Jesus, how could I want more? Many of you in here could give testimony to the goodness of God and the fact that He came in and saved you and uh, the great thing about God is, is each one of our stories is different. Uh, different people got saved in different ways, different times, uh, led by different people. And we all have a story, and that story is going to connect with someone. My, my concern when I walk in here on Sunday mornings, my concern is for those who don't have a story to tell. Their story wouldn't go beyond church attendance, their story wouldn't go beyond a baptism, their story wouldn't go beyond their own morality. And those things, none of those things work. None of those things take the place of what this trio just got finished singing about. Because nothing can take the place of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can save to the uttermost. He's the only one who can reach down to the depths of our heart and find the sin that it is at its deepest level and that which disconnects us from God and do something about the condition that we're in. We all, born into sin, we are all separated from God and we all need something beyond ourselves and that something or someone is Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a story to tell. You're not yet, but you can. The good thing is, is you may be sitting there in your seat and you might be thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not worthy. And guess what? You're right. <laughs> you know, we, we, we want to come in and we want to hear, hear somebody say, oh, yes, you're, you're worthy. No, 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 none of us are. None of us are. That's the, that's the miracle of what Jesus did is that he looked down at people who did not deserve him and he gave, them, gave himself for us regardless. 
And he makes himself available to anyone who will call out to him in confession and repentance. He makes himself available and he says, I will save you. I will cleanse you of all of your sin and I will make you a brand new person. And so if you have not, if you've never responded to Jesus Christ and his, his act of love for you, if you've never called out to him in salvation, asking repentance and forgiveness of your sins, he, he beckons you today and he invites you today to receive him. And you have a chance to do that. You have a chance to do that really right now. I, I usually say you got a chance to do that at the, end of the, at, at the end of the message today, but you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for me to tell you. You just call out to him right now, right there in your seat and he will come and he will save you. There's a lot of folks in here today, a lot, uh, a lot of, lot of um, different faces that, uh, that we're glad to see, glad to, have, uh, get, glad to have a lot of different folks in here um, that uh, don't always have the privilege of seeing. We've got, uh, got our Hispanic congregation, several of those back here in the back, back there, they've, they've learned how to be back row Baptist, okay, I'm very proud of you back there, but, uh, but glad to have you all uh, in here with us, worshiping with us. Uh, got, uh, got a whole family over here, I know that uh, I know the family's very excited to be, to be together for that, and and uh, I got some other guests that are just uh, just visiting with us. I, I was thinking, sitting over here in my seat, um, I, I knew I was going to say this, and so I, I just began to, to think back. How, how many of y'all have been in church long enough where used to, whenever you had guests who came in, the preacher would stand up and say, stand up and say a little bit about yourself. Give us your name and where you came from and all that. How many of y'all remember those days? Yep, yep, many of y'all remember that. And of course, the guests who are in here now are panicking, thinking, is that what he's about to do? I'm not going to do that to you, okay? We, don't, we, we let you just stay anonymous if you want to stay anonymous. But uh, I, just, I was just remembering those days and how, how cringeworthy they really, really were, um, except that was normal back in the day. Uh, and then we've got a lot of folks in here who are wearing t-shirts that all look alike and you got to wonder they call each other up on the phone and say hey wear your t-shirt today that's not really what happened these uh these, these were folks who were involved in our disciple now weekend for our teenagers we had about uh i don't know 18 to 20 teenagers somewhere in there who did that and then we had uh got a lot of folks a lot of folks who hosted them in their homes how many how many of you if you were if you hosted teenagers in your homes right now i am going to ask you to stand up how many of y'all hosted teenagers stand up real quick where are you? Yeah, got, okay, some over here. Yeah, yeah, crazy people, okay? These, these are the people who are crazy among us, and they need our prayers more than anybody. Um, and, then, and then in each home, there was somebody who led them in Bible studies and devotions throughout the week. If y'all are one of those Bible study leaders or devotion leader or whatever, I want y'all to stand up real quick. Where are y'all? Yeah, got some over here. Now, if you'll notice, I don't know if you notice, but a couple of these people stood up as host homes and as devotion leaders. Those are the really, really crazy people. So, uh, but uh, no, we appreciate that. And then so many people uh, uh, helped make that weekend happen. And so uh, just an exciting weekend for them and, and for, our, uh, for our student ministry. So anyway, a lot of different folks in here. Glad to have y'all. And then by the way, if you're a guest in here, and maybe you don't know a whole lot of folks in here. Let me just tell you, I've only been here about, uh, gosh, eight and a half months, nine months, something like that. Just want you to know, if you're a guest in here, you're sitting around some of the best people in, on the planet that I know. And so you should, uh, you should be glad uh, of who you're, who you're with, and you be sure, and uh, everybody be sure and welcome one another on your way out today. All right, now, we've been, uh, we've been kind of going through this journey on the loneliest road, and you may have experienced loneliness in your life. In fact, you might, you might be experiencing loneliness right now. Uh, in, in general, in your life, you may just kind of feel like you're the only one who's kind of walking through in your shoes and there's kind of no one walking beside you, or if there is, it's not many people. Some people even specifically, even specifically, you might be sitting in this room right now in the midst of all these folks and you feel like you are utterly by yourself on this planet. Or there may be some folks who are watching online right now, and you, maybe you're not even watching this live. Of course, we're not live streaming this, but you're watching it online, you know, a week or two after it's going on. And as you're sitting there watching this, you're alone in your home or at your computer or even on your phone or tablet, and you feel like it's just you. That is one of the worst feelings that you can have. And I want you to know that Whatever you might feel, however you might feel, or the circumstances surrounding your loneliness, that you have not been alone, 
that the King of kings and Lord of lords, your maker and your creator, chose, of his own volition, chose to come and take the form of a man, put on a flesh suit to walk upon this earth, not as a king, not as royalty, not as, not as the great Savior and the great I Am that he is, he chose to walk a very lonely path. He gets it. And, and as, as we see that unfold in the Gospels, and for us specifically, as you see, or as you will see in a second behind me, in the book of Mark, we see that loneliest road unfold. And it's from that lonely road that I want us to just draw a few lessons, and we've been doing that the last couple of weeks. We'll do it for the next couple of weeks as we examine how Jesus dealt with this lonely time in his, in his life. So we're, t- we're just really titled it. It's not a, not a really, uh, it's not a catchy title, sermon series title or anything like that, but it's just lessons from the loneliest road. A couple of weeks we talked about the detachment, and that was Jesus' um, Jesus's disciples, his apostles, his followers, they were in his midst. They didn't, at that point in the story, they didn't really do anything to him or or against him or any of those kinds of things. It's just that while, while they were with him, they weren't really with him. It's like I was talking about a few moments ago. You're in the midst of a crowd, and yet you still feel like you're all by yourself. Jesus understands that. And then last week, we, it got a little bit more uh, intense. It got a little bit more deliberate. It got a little bit more dirty with Judas' deception. You had detachment, and then you had deception, and the betrayal of Judas toward Jesus. As he handed Jesus over, it was an outright act that, again, set Jesus alone. And in the midst of that act, against, in the midst of that, that heinous betrayal by Judas, all of his followers then, it's not like they stuck around and he felt like he was alone. It's now that they have scattered away from him. And so the deception, had, and, and by the way, after, after they had promised him in very strong terms, very, uh, very definitively, they said, I don't care who leaves you, we ain't going nowhere. Well, guess what? The first sign of trouble, boom, they're out of there. You ever had friends like that? You ever had people like that in your life? Oh, yeah, I'm going to be with you. Man, I'm right there. I'm right there behind you. I'm with you. First sign of trouble, you're all by yourself. Well, that's where Jesus found himself in that's part of the story. Now Jesus was handed over and he was beginning to go through his trial and, and, and uh, being accused by, uh, by the Sanhedrin, by the religious leaders of his day, beginning in verse, uh, in verse 53 of, jo- of Mark chapter 14. But I want to talk to you today about denial. We left off in, uh, in, in verse 52 but now we're going, to, uh, we're going to skip, and I think next week it'll make a little bit more sense as to why we're skipping. We're going to skip over to the denial of Peter uh, that we know of. He denied Peter, I mean, he denied Jesus three times, beginning in verse 66. And so we're going to jump over to, to the, the, the story of the denial of Peter, his closest associate, the one who was set apart on this earth. Uh, more than anyone else while Jesus walked upon the planet. He had his 12 apostles that he had called out, and out of those 12, he had had three special ones, Peter, James, and John, and then even out of those three, really the one that that, uh, that was the most in his corner would have been Peter. And yet now we're going to see Peter deny him three times. What a lonely, lonely time in the life of Jesus. Now for the uh, for the sake of uh, for for the sake of context, really the story we could begin it in verse fifty three, which is where we left off last week. He said they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. And here's where Peter is mentioned again, where he comes back on the scene. Remember, in verse 50, they all left him and fled. They all uh, ran out into the darkness where they couldn't be captured along with Jesus. But now Peter has returned to the scene. In verse 54, it says, Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. He was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. So he left them, 
but now he's come back. He can see Jesus, but he's far enough away where he is himself safe. Now let's skip down to verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. He claimed ignorance. That is, the, that is the idea here. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again, he denied it. Now this word denied in the original language, in, uh, in the Greek language when it was written down, this word denied is in what they would call, in their grammar, they would call an imperfect tense. Denied was in the imperfect tense, which means that it could be translated that he was denying them. In other words, it was not just a, it was not, this particular time was not just a, not just a one single word, oh, I don't know him. No, he was saying it over, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not me. You must be having me mixed up with someone else. He was continually denying this before this little, before this little girl. So in verse, uh, uh, it, it continues on. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. He began to curse and swear. Now, if we were to think about this, and, and for, for years I thought about this in, in the way that we would... Uh, define these terms, to curse and to swear. In other words, maybe he was yelling cuss words at them or so on and so forth. But to curse was not, it was not just a matter of saying some cuss words to these people. Curse was to pronounce a curse. Like when we, when we were to pronounce a curse of some, upon someone, that is to devote them to destruction. That is the literal translation, that is the literal definition of to curse, is to devote someone to destruction. And in the original language here, just like it is at least in the translation that I just read in English, it says that he began to curse. He began to devote something or someone to destruction. But in the language, it doesn't give an object of that curse. In other words, it's not explaining what or who it is that he is, that he is condemning to destruction. Who is it talking about? And certainly in this, uh, in this particular story, he could have been pronouncing that upon those bystanders, those who were accusing him. He could have been calling out to them, I hope you are destroyed. But yet the context, the context that we have here, it would actually, most scholars would tell you, it actually lends itself to him pronouncing a curse upon himself. In other words, may, listen, I swear on my life that I don't know him. May, may I fall to pieces. May God's judgment come upon you if I am lying to you. I don't know this person. He is pronouncing cursings. He is devoting destruction upon his own head if he's lying. And guess what? He's lying. Now here's the irony of Mark. There's going to be one more thing, so hold on to this. Here's the irony of what Mark is telling us in this gospel. In the, while he is trying to, to escape the curse that is going to be put upon him if he identifies with Jesus, he is then calling upon a greater, a greater curse onto his own head because of his denial of Jesus. What he's trying to escape, he's actually falling under. What he wants to avoid, he's actually calling upon his own head. And he says, I don't know this guy. I don't know what you're talking about. This makes, this makes no sense. I promise I don't. I swear on my own life that I don't know him. I'm trying to save my life, and yet I'm going to condemn my life. He continues in verse 72. Immediately. A rooster crowed a second time. Why does that matter? Because if you read back earlier in the chapter, Jesus told him, when he, when he declares, I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to betray you, I'm never going to fall away from you, I'm never going to leave you, 
Jesus told him then, oh yeah, that rooster's going to crow three times before you, you're going to deny me three times before that rooster crows. And so he hears that rooster crowing a second time. And it's at, it's at, uh, at this point in the story that Luke, the, the, the gospel writer Luke, possibly gives one of the most chilling, condemning, shocking parts of the story that is not included anywhere else. Luke records that when he denies him that third time, Luke says that Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine the guilt that would have been heaped upon Peter at this point? Not only did he deny him, but, but you see, if you, if you understand, the courtyard was right outside of what was going on. And, and, and so Jesus, he possibly was at a window, or he was, uh, he was going, uh, they may have been carrying him uh, across that uh, courtyard to take him to, to a further trial in order to take him to crucify him. Whatever the case, they were then face to face, and not only did Peter do what he knew was wrong to do, but he looks up and he has to acknowledge that my best friend, the one that I said was the Christ, the Son of the living God, has now heard me deny him. Oh, how, how heart-rending this must have been at this particular time. And it's, and, and it's interesting that, that the, the rooster crows and Peter remembers that Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. You want to know another piece of irony that Mark is sharing with us? If you look back at a little bit earlier in this chapter, when he is, when he is being tortured and they are saying, and they were telling him, prophesy, prophesy for us. If you're the son of God, prophesy. And while they, are, while they are, are mockingly challenging him to prophesy, one of his prophecies is coming true as they speak. And so the Bible says, what, what is left to do? Chapter 14 ends with, and he began to weep. Or as Matthew and Luke both record, he began to weep bitterly. What a story. What difficulty. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, once again left all alone. The loneliest road. Now, if you think about this story, and I hope you, hope you have, your, uh, hope you have your, your growth guide there that you had in your, uh, in your bulletin, and maybe you've already taken a few notes, but if not, then I hope you will pick up here where we, where we find a characterization of Peter, and I've got three words or three phrases that I'd like for you to write down as it pertains to Peter and the condition that Peter was in in the story. Because you may find yourself identifying, oddly enough, in the midst of all this, you may be able to identify with Peter. The first thing, there are three things that we're going to characterize Peter. The first thing that we're going to see in Peter was, Peter, in this story, was courageous. Now that may surprise you, but we really need to give Peter the benefit of the doubt. We, um, we spent a lot of time condemning Peter over the story, but think about Peter being courageous. Peter, the only reason that he is in the story to deny and in the position where he is in order to be able to deny Jesus three times is because he was actually one of the only ones who was brave enough to be present there in the first place. All the other disciples had fled. Now, the Gospel of John tells us that there was another disciple there with him. But of all the disciples, of all of his followers who took off in the midst of the night, who was willing to put themselves in position, in that dangerous position to begin with? It was Peter. Peter was courageous. Peter, Peter had made a, a brave declaration at the Lord's Supper. He has said, I'm not, though everybody else fall away, I will not fall away. And he was doing everything in his own power to follow through with that promise. Peter was present because Peter was courageous. This is the first thing you've got to understand. The second thing that I want you to understand is that Peter was in over his head. 
He was in over his head. He was doing everything in his power, but he was in over his head. He did everything that he could, and he still failed. He was in over his head. Now, I want you to, again, picture where we are. You're in a, you're in a courtyard, okay? You're in a courtyard, and right next door is the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, which is where Jesus was first being grilled. And once he failed that test, and of course, uh, next week we're going to see it's almost humorous, he had to, Jesus had to work to fail the test in this trial, okay? Just go through and read it. It's, it's almost humorous if it wasn't so tragic. But he, it, as soon as he fails that test, they begin, they begin beating on him. They begin spitting at him. They begin, they begin to torture him right there. And Peter is right outside in the courtyard. And some people say that courtyard was open. Some people say it was a building right next door. But it's right next door. And they can, Peter can hear everything that's going on. He can hear them calling out to crucify. Hear the punches in the face time and time again. He can hear the spitting. He can hear the mocking. He can hear it all going on. And just put yourself in his position. You're courageous enough to even be there. And then you hear what's going on to your friend. Do you want to identify with that? Do you want to put yourself in a position where you are going to have to go through that? Peter made a brave declaration and he was doing everything that he could to follow through. But he was in way over his head. The last thing I want you to know is that in the end, it is true, we just can't get around it, Peter was a failure. He failed his Lord. He bailed out. At the time that Jesus, humanly speaking, needed him the most, Peter bailed. He was a failure. Now, to this point, to this point in our story, in, the, in this point in our sermon series, I guess really just the last two weeks, I make it sound like we've been in this thing for two months. We haven't. Just for the last two weeks, I have done my best to try to help you identify with where Jesus was so that when you are where Jesus was, and there are times that we are, how it is that you can deal with that, how it is that you can handle that. And people identify with that. People, can, people understand loneliness. And when you begin to talk about loneliness, that gets people's attention because most people have been there at some point in time or another. Today, I'm not so sure that people want to identify with what I have to say. Because the question is, what about when it's you? And I don't mean when you're in Jesus' place. I'm talking about what about when you are in Peter's place? And it's one thing, certainly there are probably times where we can identify even, even very closely with where Peter is in terms of our relationship with God because we get around certain friends. We, we, we go to work and we have to mimic the language at work. We go to school, disciple now folks. We go to school and... We have to act like they do, and we have to treat other people the way that they do, and we, we just want to conform, we just want to fit in, we just kind of want to be like everybody else, blend into the crowd so that we'll be liked. What happens when we conform to the world and we begin to deny Jesus because it's not the, the cool, it's not the in thing to do? We, in an essence, we are like Peter. And there are other times where as much as we as much as we don't want to admit it, as much as we want to give reasons and excuses for it, there are other times where there are people in our lives, they might be family, might be friends, might be acquaintances, might be co-workers, fellow students, that they, they, they feel alone and, and God has called you to move in and walk in beside them and they have placed a certain measure of trust in you to make them not alone and you have bailed on them. What is it that what, what do we do when we become like Peter? That doesn't resonate so well because all of a sudden we're not the victim, we are the victimizer. We don't like that as much. But for those who are honest, and again, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to gather lessons from the loneliest road, and there have to, there has to be lessons for those of us who are the perpetrators too. There has to be some measure of hope for us as well. And so for those who may, 
may come to admit and, and realize maybe I bailed on Jesus or maybe I bailed on this friend and I left them all by themselves. What do I do? What about when it's me? And I want to just share three things very quickly about what to do when it is you. I want you to take on three different attitudes, and here they are. The first one is take on the attitude of humility. The attitude of humility. Now, at this point in our story, Peter is still just a failure. But if you go on and read the rest of the story, many of you have, but some of you have not, when you go on to read the rest of the story, you see that Peter is restored. When you go through and read John's gospel, it's going, to it's going to tell you about an encounter after the resurrection that Jesus had with Peter, and he asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Ask him a third time, Peter, do you love me? The Bible says, John says, that man, Peter, when Jesus asked him a third time, it grieved his heart. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of commentary about why did that grieve him? Why, did it, why is it that after the third time, why did it grieve him? And there are a lot of people who like to go in and they like to, they like to look at the Greek words. And if you're not into this discussion, don't worry about it. They look at, like to look at the, uh, the fact that Jesus used um, a, a different word the third time for love than he did the first two times. And that, that preaches well, but it's probably not probably not the case, okay? Jesus wasn't speaking in Greek. He was speaking in Aramaic. That's probably not what happened. It's probably that the third time was a reminder, you, deny, you denied me three times. Let me restore you three times. Whatever the case, whatever it is that grieved him, Peter reached a point of humility where he had to come to a point and realize, I really messed up. I really blew it in this relationship. He had to have, he had to take on humility. And there are two ways that you can do that. Number one is own it. Own it. Don't deny it. Don't make excuses for it. Don't try to get around it. Own it. Yes, I blew it. Yes, I failed my Lord. Yes, I failed my friend. Whatever it is, own it. Number two, seek forgiveness. Seek forgiveness. You may or may not get that forgiveness. It may be granted to you by the one that you offended, or it might not. But insofar as you are able, live at peace with all men. Notice what the Bible says. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. It's in your outline and will be behind me. So if you're standing before the altar in the temple, in other words, you're getting ready to go to church to offer a sacrifice to God, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there postpone worship go and be reconciled to that person then come and offer sacrifice to God if you're taking notes I want you to there in your outline I want you to underline that phrase has something against you if, you, if they think they have something against you you go and make it right the first is humility. The second attitude I would encourage you to have if you've blown it is dependency. Dependency. You can't rely on your own strength. Notice, notice what, what uh, uh, Jesus told his disciples. You want to do what is right, but you're weak. Did you know that this is, one, this is an interesting uh, fact that this story of Peter, now you've got to remember who Peter was. Peter was like the, the hallmark apostle. He was like the head honcho. He's the one that everybody respected the most. He was the foremost of all the disciples. And yet all four gospels record this story. All four make sure that their readers know that Peter, the main dude, the head honcho, that guy denied Jesus three times. You know why they, you know, you know why they put it all, all of them put it in there? If it can happen to Peter, you can do it too. Don't, don't think that you're above this. Everybody is susceptible to this. Don't depend on your own strength. Notice how, notice how the Amplified Version translates John 15, 5. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. 
So don't boast in yourself talking about what a great friend you are, what a great disciple or follower of Jesus you are. No, you, you in humility, you say, God, this is, this is who I want to be, but I must depend on you. I need your strength. I need your strength to go against the flow of everybody at work. I need your strength to, to, to betray what everybody else is doing at my school, and I simply want to follow you and do the right thing by you and by the people that you've put me in front of. Dependency. And then the third is res- resiliency. A third attitude needs to be resiliency. You see, Peter blew it. We've, we've said in here Peter was a failure in today's passage. And then in, at the end of John, John comes and um, Jesus comes and restores him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. I want Peter, you are the man. You're the one I'm, I'm trusting with this message to go into the, all the world. Despite what you have done, despite your record, and we always, we always like to say, well, our, our, our past is going to determine our future. Our, our past uh, uh, failures are going to be, repeat themselves in the future. Listen, Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that chance. Peter, I want you to lead the way. And guess what? You turn to Acts chapter 2 and you read through the first part of the book of Acts and you'll find that's exactly what Peter did. Peter bounced back. We don't see him denying him. We see him speaking to the masses. We see him speaking to the masses in the group in a religious circle. We see him standing before civic groups, people who could have uh, who could have administered the same punishment that he was trying to avoid in today's passage. He puts himself right back in front of them and he says, "Oh man, I was wrong before. Let me tell you. This guy that you crucified, he is the risen Lord." He was no longer ashamed and he didn't blow it anymore. Don't blow it anymore. Resiliency. Resiliency. I messed up and, I, and I'm going to own up to messing up. But man, moving forward, in the strength of Jesus Christ, I won't do that again. I will not mess up that way again because I am going to depend on him. It's even said that Peter... Peter went through to martyrdom. I say legend. It, it, it's, uh, it is widely believed that Peter did end up giving his life for the Lord Jesus by crucifixion. And so he, he, he said, I'm not going to do that again. Resiliency. May that attitude be ours as well. Learn from the mistakes of the past. Now, you might be a Peter in here today, not just because you've blown it once, but because, listen, you, you, Jesus has been like off the radar for you. It's not been somebody that you have, uh, you haven't been a, a friend and denied, you've simply done the denial part. And Jesus just hasn't been part of your life. Well, listen, we want to we wanna give you the opportunity, just like we started with, we want to give you the opportunity to come and know him, to come and receive him. He's the one who gives the strength. He's the one who gives the peace. He's the one who gives the direction for future. And if you want those things in your life, we want to make Jesus available to you and to have a time for you to be able to come and receive him. It's what we call an invitation time. And in just a moment, I'm I'm about to pray, and as soon as I get finished praying, we're going to have people playing music and people singing and all that kind of stuff. Listen. If you've never repented of your sins, if you've never called upon Jesus to save you from your sin, I I just want you to forget about the music. I don't want you to worry about what's going on around you. I'm going to be standing down front, and I simply want you to leave your seat from wherever you are, balcony, down here, in the back, in the front, doesn't matter. I want you to come down, and I just want you to tell me, hey, listen, I want to receive Jesus today. I want to be saved today. And we'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions, and we'll, uh, we're, we're not going to we're not going to do anything to embarrass you or any of that kind of stuff. I simply want to talk to you. I can't know. I can't know to talk to you unless you come and tell me. So come and talk to me. Just let me know right down here in just a moment. Others of you, may, may, you may have blown it. You may have blown it with your Lord, and you just may need to take some time. Uh, it might have been very recently. You just need to take some time and ask him to forgive you. He will. He will. He, he did it for Peter. If you go through and you read the story after the resurrection... There are several times where he specifically singles out Peter for restoration. He'll restore you. He's got the ability and he's got the want to to restore you. Just call out to him. 
and, 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 and confess and ask forgiveness. Others of you, this is, this is a little bit more difficult. You ready for this? There may be somebody else, maybe even in this very room, that you blew it with. You blew it. They needed you in a great, desperate time, and you bailed on them. Go to them. Go to them before you leave this room. Go to them and ask for forgiveness. I am, I am sorry that I blew it. You know, we, we don't do church like that anymore. You know why? It's just too transparent. It's too real. But I'm, 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 I'm sick of church playing games. I, I just, that, that, that has no place in my life, has no place in your life, has no place in the kingdom of God. It's about time that we were just going to be real with one another, and sometimes that is seeking out forgiveness of other people in our own fellowship. And so if, you, if you've blown it with somebody, they may not even know it. They may not hold a grudge, or they might. Just go to them. I blew it, and I'm sorry. All that in the invitation time, right after I pray. God, we thank you that, that you restore. We, we see what Peter did, and we think that it's heinous, and, and it was. And yet we know, if we're honest, that we're all guilty of that at some point in our lives. We have, we've bailed on you at some point. So we thank you for the restoration that you gave to Peter and how blatant his transaction was. And so, God, we, we find hope in that. But, Lord, we also confess that we need you because we don't want to blow it again. We want to be resilient, but we're also dependent. And so we need your strength to hold steady. God, I pray that uh, if there's anybody in this room and they don't know you, they don't have a relationship with you, that they would surrender to you today and that you would come in and you would save them, miraculously save them. And I also pray for the body of Christ that we would be real with one another. And if there is, uh, there's something, some hindrance in a, in a relationship in here because somebody has blown it in the past, I pray that that would be healed before they walk out of this room. I, I pray that you'd put a barrier up, put people in their way, lock the doors, whatever needs to happen. May it happen so that we can walk out of here having restored with one another. God, thank you for this invitation time. May we make the most use of it. Have your own way in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand.